So, hola, hola, mi gente. Welcome to another episode of the Wine and Cheese My Podcast. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you will see that I'm in a very, like, the whole setup is very, very different. Um, I'm actually at my parents' house. I'm on their balcony. If I'm sweating, I don't know. Uh, I love you can tell like it's hot here. I'm in Orange County and it's like I'm in inland Orange County and it's like 90 degrees. I'm from Orange so County. It is. Are you? What part? I'm from I, I grew up in Buena Park, like Fullerton. I went oh, to high yeah, school. Yeah. yeah, I went to my high parents school. Live in Belinda. Oh, land of gracious living. I'm very familiar. Yes. Yes. And you live in Dallas now. I actually lived in Dallas for 15 years. Well, so then you know real heat. Like, like yes. it's funny. Like, Dallas is hot, but we don't sit outside. We just give up no. and we only sit inside. So I always say, like, when you people are like, so oh, California is so outdoors that, like, you just suffer yeah. outside pretending that it's, like, cool when it's not. Well, you know, the, well, I also, I live in San Diego, so it's always, a, and that's where I grew up in San Diego. So it's always at least a good 10 degrees cooler there than it is here. So yeah, we're outside all the time. I mean, I am fully embraced my California, like my San Diego and Venus. Like our ideal is between 65 and 78 max, right? If it gets lower than that or higher than that, we're like, oh, what's happening? It's so crazy. But when I, when I lived in Dallas, it was that, like, it's that humidity. And I remember one summer, my AC had gone out in my car. And thankfully, we lived in, I lived in an apartment where you have, like, uh, the parking structure. You could park, like, on your floor. Yeah, but that doesn't help when it's like 100 degrees with like 100% humidity or 80% humidity even by the time I got down to get out of the garage I was already sweating. It was horrible. It was just mist. Obviously you have misters all the time everywhere. It's just it's so miserable and I do not miss that weather. I do not miss it whatsoever. <laughs> well, but when I go to Orange County, I'm like why do you guys pay like it's gotten orange county has gotten significantly hotter over the last couple decades i mean it just it is it's yeah. way hotter um it my my birthday my birthday's near halloween so that's a perfect marker because my birthday used to be cold and now my birthday is sweltering hot like i can't do like fun fall birthday stuff anymore i have to like incorporate the hot weather for my birthday and i feel like california is so hot and again like because you're outside I'm like, we're having an outdoor wedding. Like, like at least in Dallas, we admit that it's hot and we just stay in the AC. That's my thing. So like for me, yeah. I get so hot in California because we're sitting on the beach and we just got a lot of sun and sand and no, no AC. <laughs> so in a weird way, I feel more spoiled now being in Dallas because yes, it's hotter, but you're outside less. So, but I do, I will say like, I run less, definitely run less here than there so yeah Dallas is a very like I tell people brunch there's no I don't know if there's a bigger brunch place maybe Atlanta than Dallas like Dallas is all about the brunch all about the patio when it's when the weather suffices right uh, when the weather allows it but it's just yeah I, I don't miss that black ice during the winter time uh, I've spun out on it before I, yeah, on the way to the airport one time, I spun out uh, on the bridge. And I, so I just like the weather is so, so crazy here. Yeah, it's definitely gotten a lot warmer. Don't tell me global warming is not real because it is because we feel it, right? Um, but I still like, there's no place. Like I knew, always knew I was going to come back home to San Diego. That's where I love it. That's where I, in fact, now, when me and my husband started dating, I still I told him, look, I've lived in three states. I've lived in multiple cities. I'm back home in San Diego and I'm not moving again. So if you plan on leaving San Diego, don't date me because I'm not leaving San Diego. Like it would be a waste. And now we're married. We did have an outside wedding, but it was so the wind was so crazy during our wedding. Um, but it was very the actual ceremony was only like our immediate family so it was only like 10 minutes long 
And then as soon as we got to the reception, the wind was gone. I was like, really? We have all these pictures of my veil all over the place. And it's crazy. But I want to read your bio and we get into all of the chisme. Uh, Ella Park Parlor is a marketing powerhouse whose campaigns have yielded over a billion, yes, I said billion with a B, dollars in sales globally. She is a founding partner of EP Consulting, podcaster, speaker, real estate investor, and the author of the best-selling book, High Tolerance. Ella's SEFPH philosophy, so it's spiritual, emotional, financial, and physical, encourages empowers encourages and empowers leaders to find success across multiple channels in life she dives into the nuances of building success in her podcast eavesdrop with ella and i like that you say you're black skin you're mexican and you're black and i am like i said i'm, I'm super excited to kind of chat with you because like about your book about what you're doing but before we get into the chisme, we always start with the wine. I don't know if you are partaking or not. If you are, please share what wine you are drinking. If not, girl, don't even worry about it. Well, um, ¿por qué es el verano? I am actually sipping on tequila. So instead of the wine, oh. I went with tequila. And it's because um, I don't drink wine. I do not drink wine, which is ironic because I've worked for several wine brands, but <laughs> I, and I will do sparkling wine. Actually, yesterday I bought a beautiful bottle of champagne. I saw at the store, it was very ornate and beautiful. And I was like, oh, I, I want to try that. Threw it in the fridge, take it out. I realized it was a rosé, not a champagne. And I was like, oh no, I thought it was a cava. So I do sparkling. I'll do like a cava or a Prosecco or a champagne, but I do not do wines. Um, I did go, I just came back from Spain and France. So I got to enjoy some wineries and all that. I will, I've been on several wine tastings, but I don't drink wine. It's one of my like dirty little secrets. Oh, that's, I like it. You're kind of dirty. But you know what? That's, I, the one thing I love about wine is it's so subjective, right? So everybody has like different things. And I say, as long as you've tried it, you know, if you had, who knows, you might find one you like in the future, but maybe you don't, I don't know, but at least you've tried it. Like I hate to me when people are like, I don't like it. I'm like, have you tried it? No. But how do you know if you like it or not? Right. So it's one of those things. I'm well, always I down am, to try. Yes. I'm actually drinking uh, a red blend, a 2020 red blend from Oak Mountain Winery. They're actually a Latino owned winery in Temecula, California. And it's called Steve Wine. Now, Steve is the previous owner. So it wasn't initially started by a Latino. And we did a podcast on Oak Mountain, uh, you know, last season. And we, so the, the previous owner, his name was Steve. So they still kept that wine, that brand and everything. So let me say, does it say what? So this is 50% Cabernet. 25% Malbec, 19.5% Merlot, and 5% Cab Franc. So, and this one, I haven't tried it yet. So, but what I did, because it's obviously warm and it's hot and people are like, I don't like, I'm definitely one of those people I drink less red wine during the warmer months. But what I did today is I put my wine glass in the freezer, not the wine in the refrigerator, but my wine glass in the freezer so I poured my wine, it would be like a proper room temperature. It wouldn't be like 80 degrees, but it would be more like 60, 65 degrees. That's so clever. salud. I don't salud. think, yeah, this doesn't give me my, my thing, but salud. <laughs> salud. Oh, hmm. Definitely, this is definitely a drier wine. Definitely not very sweet, which I'm okay with. I'm I'm not a big sweet wine fan, but this is good. Like the temperature right now, since I put the glass in the freezer, is perfect. Like it's not that. like yeah, I don't feel like too. So there's a tip for you guys: if it, if you want to drink red wine, don't and it's hot, but you're like, you know, put just put your glass in the freezer for like twenty minutes. That'll help cool down the wine without changing like 
the actual stuff. And I'd open the wine earlier to let it kind of, mm, to let it air, like aerate and everything. Well, okay. And it's in the RGNY glass. RGNY is a Latina owned winery in the North Fork of Long Island. Ooh. So, you know. All right, now let girl, let's get into it. Cause I, we were just, we were having conversation before we hit record and everything. First of all, let me just say congratulations to you. <laughs> just got engaged. Oh, yeah. I didn't know it's which congratulations. So Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that. Like, you know, um, I know we were just talking kind of about a lot of different things and it's kind of this weird season for both of us right now for in different ways. Um, and, but I want to make sure that I say that it's okay to celebrate yourself. It's okay to celebrate, like, even though there's this weird, weird things going on around you, I think it's so important that we take those moments that are good to remind ourselves that there is good that can come out of these weird seasons. There is good and there still is things that you're able to celebrate. Um, even because if we, if we can't take those moments, those moments pass us by and you don't ever want to regret that moment passing you by and saying, why well, I wish I would have celebrated and now, you know, so I just want to remind you of that, that it's okay to celebrate. Um, and I hope that you do get to be able to celebrate with your loved ones in the way that you want. And it's like the way you and your fiance want, because that's all that matters. Oh my gosh. You might appreciate this on our first date. He took me to play Loteria at a like salsa bar and they didn't have any more like chips for the loteria so we literally had to use tortilla chips and <laughs> i was like okay what like whatever fine so we're breaking up tortilla chips and we're playing loteria and i'm like translating the different cards for him if he doesn't know what they are like what does that mean and then i go to the bathroom and there was a painting of a woman getting a ring from a man and this was our first date. This was our first date. So I went on Instagram and I was, I was joking, but I was like, you guys, like they're playing Selena. We're playing Loteria. Look at this painting. I'm going to marry this guy. And I, I, I'm being funny. Like it was a first date and, um, but I did like him a lot already. And so it was really exciting because I got to repost that video saying, oh, I called it. I called it. Oh, it's I'm going to have to like, I'm going to have to go. Yeah. <laughs> and look at it that's awesome yeah so I feel like so what at the end of that date did you know where you're like yeah wait I was joking but now I'm not really joking well I mean after our first date it's just so hard I mean so first of all my book is called high tolerance because it talks about having a high tolerance for pain and difficult things right so when you've experienced pain trauma disappointments in life I do find and I think this comes with age unfortunately it's a lot harder to celebrate sometimes because you know that there was pain on the other side of this it was a painful journey to get there or whatnot and so for me for a first date like I I, I struggle even in this season I'm so happy I'm in love I love him but there is a part of me and I had to I told him this like a couple days after he proposed where, I mean, I've been engaged before and it didn't work out. And so we didn't, we never got married. So like the wedding was called off. So as excited as I want to be, I'm reminded like, well, you've been excited before and it didn't work out. You've been disappointed before. You've been humiliated before. You had to cancel your wedding. You went on your honeymoon by yourself. Are you really going to get excited about an engagement? And so it's hard because in life, you're absolutely right. You need to celebrate everything that you have. But I think when you have a lot of experience that precedes it, you're like, Oh, you, you, you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And so I, our first date was six hours. I was smitten. I was like, I was, I just, he really took my breath away. I really liked him, but it's like, how many first dates have we had that we know end up train wrecks down the line? So yeah. I, I, I don't, I'm very much like, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. I'm like, yes, I'm so happy to be engaged and I'm grateful for this ring, but I'm like, I ain't married. 
you know, like he, he could turn around tomorrow and say, never mind. And there's no paperwork or anything like that. I don't have any legal rights to anything right now. Um, it's ceremonious. And so I, that's where I think I, I do struggle. And, and as we mentioned, or as you mentioned, there are just other things that happen in life where you start to go, wow, it's exciting. You know, I'm 34, I'll be 35 in the fall. And it's different getting engaged at that age versus like 25, you know, it's yeah. just, it's different. And so I mean, I totally, you know, I'm, I mean, look, I agree with you. I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, when my fiance proposed, I was 45. And now I'm 46. And it was one of those things like, I have been proposed to before, but I've said no. And then I went a very long time and I was like, now those were in my twenties. And then I was like, well, oh, dang, <laughs> is this ever going to happen again? But, you know, and I, you go through those times where you think it's going to happen and it doesn't, or you're in situation. I was in a very long situation shit and you're like, you know, and I think all of those things, you have to learn from them instead of feeling like, oh, this was terrible. This was whatever. I, I think we have to kind of take lessons from each of those things and say, okay, so when the first one comes, like Antonio and I, we had, I think our first date was like four or five hours as well. And we closed down the restaurant Then we went somewhere else. Yeah. It was just like one of those, we just had a great time talking and, and everything. And within a few weeks, when you say like, you're waiting for the shoot, the other shooter drop, I so understand because within a few weeks we were on the phone and goes, so I, I did something today and I'm not sure how you're going to feel about it. And I was just like, oh, great. Like, okay, here's the other shoot. Yeah. And he's like, I called you my girlfriend at work today. And my reaction, because I understand what you're talking about, was, oh, well, you know, you can still date other people, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think you should date other people. <laughs> and <laughs> because that was like my reactionary thing, like, whoa, 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 what do you mean? And he was just like, no. What do you, what? No, I don't want to date anybody else. Like, I like you. This is where I want to put my energy. I don't want to date anybody else. And it was something I had never experienced before. Like somebody, not somebody liking me, but somebody who's just like saying, no, like, I don't care what, like, if you want me to date somebody else, like other guys would be like, all right, cool. Yeah, whatever. He was like, no, this, that's not what I want. And the, and then when you have your first argument and he was like, look, you can be mad at me, but I'm not going anywhere. So I went again. I was like, what? So it was like these experiences that I feel like I never really truly had before that I got to have with him because I feel like anytime I was upset or mad, they might be like, oh, try to appease me, but then really not. Right. Like really just mm -hmm. kind of do their own thing. So I get it. 10 years ahead from, you know what I mean? Like you're almost 35, I was 45. So like fast forward 10 years being in that yeah. spot. Uh, so I, I, I get it. But then on the other side, I'm like, you know what? There has been, I, there has been a lot of loss in, in my family, among my friends. There has been, like now I'm finding this person who I have experienced something that I never truly experienced, even with the other guys that proposed, it was very, it's very different. So I had to realize I had to take this relationship. I couldn't put it on anything else. This relationship was this relationship and not anything else. So I could still learn from the other things, but not dig into past of other relationships and put it on here. So yeah, absolutely. I think especially when you're independent, I, I mean, I, so I, I think like I have so much gratitude. My last relationship was a hot mess. I talk about it in, in the book, High Tolerance, and I don't paint him in the best light, but one of the things I will always be grateful for, and I don't talk about this part in the book, is that 
he taught me so much. He taught me a lot about how I come across, about how what I say and what I feel don't match. Like he called me out a lot on things. And so the example of, well, you could date other people if you want, right? Like I would make a comment like that. And he would say, do you actually want me to date other people? Is that what you want? Because my understanding is you want to date me and we're here with the same goal. But now you're telling me something different. And he would call me out on my things and talk it out with me. And he challenged so many one-liners, we'll call it, that I'd been using for years really to protect myself, right? It's like, yeah, you can date other women if that's what you want. I mean, I'm not going to stick around and watch you do it, but go for it. Like in my head, I'm like, do what you want, right? It was do almost like a, like a dare. Go ahead, do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and then he would call me out all the time. He would say, that's not what you want. That's not what you mean. So don't say things like that. Like, because other men are going to go, oh, she must not be that interested. So I will go date other women, right? And I'm such a firm believer that you must be impeccable with your word. It's a book, The Four Agreements, be impeccable Four with agreements. your word. Yes, exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a hard balance, right? Like, because I am someone who is so authentic. I've been, you know, I've given a, I've been given a hard time about the fact that I wear my heart on my sleeve. And you always know where you stand with me because I don't fake the funk. I am who I am. I show up in true authenticity and everyone talks about authenticity nowadays like authentic ingredients yeah. and authenticity and be yourself and all that well i've been living that life and it's not easy sometimes being fake gets you a lot further because you're a lot more digestible and a lot more palatable for people and so while i don't feel like i tailor my message at all I am always trying to protect myself from future harm. And so that can show up as like saying things that I don't fully mean. Like, yeah, you can go date other women. I mean that. Like you can. I want to know your character now. But what really yeah. I should be saying, if I'm being honest and fully in my integrity would be, I don't want you to feel like you're restraining yourself because of my desires but let it be known my desire is that I want to be with you and you alone and I want us to be in a monogamous relationship but holy cow that little sentence is really hard to say that's why we end up in situationships right yeah because saying totally. something that real is too real and what do the men do when you talk like that they run for the hills Oh, girl. Yes, I, I get it. Wait, you said that your birthday was around Halloween. When is your birthday? I'm October 27th. So I'm a Scorpio. Okay, I'm a Scorpio as well. So my my dad's is October 26th. Mine's November 2nd. Oh, my gosh. We're all the same week. I love that. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. Like, even just re when I was just reading your stuff and just kind of going through it, I was like, they're like I'm like I have a lot in common with her just like I could just feel it right and then everything you're saying I'm like oh I know oh, I get it oh I know <laughs> For sure. but I want to kind of roll back because some you know you were saying you're always you know you've kind of always been this way I get that um you grew up in Orange County then right is that where you mm -hmm. grew you grew up in this Orange County area um and being of mixed race right being a black skin um i think what side is what and what do you feel like growing up did you ever feel like you had to did you feel like people only saw you as one thing or did you ever feel like you had to pick a side as you present yourself like people look at you and they see a black woman mm -hmm. right being latino be you're that's an ethnicity it's not you know we get that. I understand that. But when people see you, they're going to, they, and if you start speaking Spanish, they might be like, what? Huh? Like yeah. what kind of, how was it growing up in Orange County in particular, but in the Fullerton area, it's a little bit less Orange County than Orange County than other places of Orange County. <laughs> yeah. Well, my mother was born in Mexico and she moved to Orange County when she was two years old with her now five brothers and sisters there were less back then but now there are there's six of them um and they all grew up in orange county so a pretty predominant mexican catholic family in orange county 
Um, and there's a lot of pride with that. So on my mother's side, a lot of pride. Not only do we have Mexico right over the border, right? Like literally two hours away. I grew up going to uh, Mexico a lot as a child. Um, then you add the language, the music, the just the the proximity of all of it. My father, who is black, his side of the family is all on the East Coast. They're in the South Carolina. They are um, more dignified, more formal, more military, um, uh, high education on all sides of my family. All of my family's pretty educated. Um, but they're East Coast, which, if you know, that's just a little bit different of a culture. Um, and so we'll say being a little hyperbolic, like highfalutin, you know, formal culture. And but they were further away. I mean, there was a time change. So, you know, if we talk to them at five o'clock, it's eight o'clock their time. It was just it was very disconnected. And that doesn't mean I was disconnected from my Black culture in the sense that I lived, you know, L.A. was around the corner. My father was an LAPD officer, which adds another layer of complexity into Ooh, my background. Oh, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here I am. I always say, like, I'm America. That's like my new thing. I'm America. I am the daughter of a Mexican immigrant. I am the daughter of a Black man who is a direct descendant of slaves. Um of of slaves in America. My father was a police officer and served in the US military as a Marine Corps officer. I grew up in a predominantly white Asian neighborhood. So when you add all of that together, like I really am the epitome of multicultural. I've studied several languages. I've traveled around the world. I truly love a lot of different cultures and know a lot of different cultures. And I love people from all different types of ethnicities, backgrounds, languages, all of that stuff. And I grew up like that because I grew up in a very worldly multicultural dynamic. I, when people ask like, do you feel like a minority or do you feel like one? I feel the most like a woman. That's what I feel. Like I feel like a woman, like I'm not a man. When we talk about us versus them, I feel that way about men. Like, it's like, whether you're a black man, white man, gay man, straight, whatever you are, you're a man. I feel different than you. I don't necessarily feel a connection to someone just because we have the same ethnic background or are from the same area. But I do feel a connection with women. Um, and I think that's just because I went to an all girls school. So that's probably a, a part of it, like the female empowerment. Um, I, you know, you look at my, my mom, my, my mom is Mexican. She looks white, which is also a factor. So she doesn't look Latina. Um, my family is part of my family in Mexico is very light skin, light hair, light eyes. My brother has light eyes. My dad is black and has light eyes. And so, you know, my mother had to deal with, she's like incognito, you know, she's operating in Orange County and people don't know she's Mexican. So she's hearing things that maybe the average Mexican in Orange County wouldn't hear to their face. Right. Um, and, and so with that last name as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, she yeah. Yeah. And so when you put all of this together, what that means is I learned from a very early age, like I don't look like my mother. People never thought she was my mom. You know, we, I got lost at Knott's Berry Farm, which is a amusement park in Orange County. I got lost at Knott's Berry Farm one time and my mother walked in and said, is my daughter in here? And I heard her voice, but I was in the kitty jail around the corner so I could hear her, but I couldn't see her. And the woman goes and looks over at the kids in the jail and it's just me. And she goes, no, that's what the woman said. She didn't say, what's her name? Let me, you know, she just looked at me and said, no, your daughter's not here. And I yelled, Mom! because <laughs> I was like I didn't want my mom to leave me right and then if my mom and I go to a restaurant people will say how many in your party and my mom was like two and then they look at me how many in your party I mean people just don't think and she is my birth mother and so I've had a life of the world trying to say that's not your mom even if they're not saying it directly right because I don't look yeah. like her, but she is my mother. She gave birth to me and I actually do look more like her than people realize. And then you add that my dad is black. My brother came out. He looks like Arab Egyptian. He doesn't look black and he doesn't necessarily look Latino. He just looks like Arab. 
none of us look alike. My mom looks like she could be white. My dad looks black. I look mixed. That's what I always get told, right? I look black mixed. And then my brother looks Egyptian. So I grew up knowing what you look like doesn't matter. We're family. It doesn't matter that your mom is something different than your dad. We are family. We are blood. And my father was adopted. So then you add that into it, right? Like blood is only so thick because what matters is yeah. love. What matters is respect. What matters is taking care of people. And so I don't, I think I feel like nobody, like there is no other black Mexican woman. Really, I haven't met, I really haven't met any in the world, but just even in my own family, on my Mexican side, if I go to a Mexican, a party on the Mexican side of my family, I'm the only black woman in the room. If I go to a party with my black side of the family, I'm the only Latina in the room, right? So I'm the other no matter what. And that's okay. And that's always been celebrated because it's never been, oh, our black Mexican daughter. It's just been our daughter. Like who I am yeah. is inherently given to me through through a power bigger than myself. And I think that that's where I don't really have like a chip on my shoulder. Now, I do get a chip on my shoulder about feeling more Latina because people will say to me, you're not Mexican. You're not you're like Dominican or something. I'm like, first of all, tell any Dominican or Puerto Rican or Boricua or any Cuban that they're Mexican. Watch how they react. Go, oh, don't call me Mexican, right? I'm like, why would yeah. I lie? Who's over here lying about being Mexican? Nobody. <laughs> like, nobody. <laughs> nobody. Okay. Yeah. They're like, quick to say, don't call me Mexican, right? Because that's what Americans do. They call everybody and Me they call anybody who's of Latin background, Mexican, right? Yeah. And so it's like, why would I lie? Why would I lie about that? Um, and so it's it's very interesting, but I realize again, like it's not about necessarily even the language we speak. Like it really just is about you. There are places where we all belong. And if we want to focus on where we feel like the other, we can hyper-focus on that and make ourselves feel more ostracized than we are. When I moved to Alabama, that's when I got a wake-up call. I was 22 years old, moved to Alabama, and I experienced blatant, ugly racism. I experienced segregation for the first time in my life. Uh, for the first time in my life, I was told several times in different various reasons and ways that I wasn't allowed to do something because of the color of my skin. I had never had that before the age of 22. I'd be called the oh, N word. What here took you to Alabama? My job, my job. Yeah. So uh, it was a you know, promotion. that's, that's so crazy because uh, first of all, I want to just kind of go back to what you said. And when you were saying your, your mom is very white passing and she doesn't look Latina. We come in all, obviously, you look in your own family. We come in, you come in all, and we, Latinos, we come in all shapes, sizes, colors, hair, textures, all of the things, right? Like, you have somebody, like, really dark complected. Like, I'm, I'm, I know I'm a light-skinned Latina, but everybody looks at me and they're, they think I'm Puerto Rican first. Like, first, they always like, you're, are you Puerto Rican? I'm like, no, but I mean, I don't really, whatever. I'm like, no, I'm Mexican, but it's that we have, that's something like we have to get over. And I love that in your family, you had such diversity that you're like, like what you learned, it's what, like within your little unit, right? How, and what you're portraying out. Um, unfortunately, like not everybody else looks at you in the same way as you look at yourself. So thank you for sharing about Alabama because I actually do want to ask you that because obviously your experience growing up here versus going to Alabama is very, very different. How did you handle that? Because like I said at the beginning, obviously people look at you, you present as a black woman and and here you might say, oh, no, I'm, I'm a Mexican. They might say, no, you're not. You're like, you're like look, I'm too tired. You're probably like, look, I'm too tired to explain myself to you. You just got to deal with it, right? But when you go somewhere like Alabama, how did you navigate that? Because that can be a very, like, that can make you almost question everything that you've grown up with. A thousand percent. That's exactly what happened. Um, 
So I dealt with blatant racism, being told I couldn't go places. Now I will say the population, and I'm not being hyperbolic, it was 50% white, 50% black. No Latin, no Latinos. When I say no, I don't mean literally zero people. I mean literally zero percent, right? So less than one percent, because we're talking like you'd have to have thousands of people to even make it one percent. It literally the where I lived, it was 49.5 percent black and then like 50 percent white. I mean, I'm I really mean it when I say 50, 50, black and white. No Asian, no Latino. That meant that all the Mexican restaurants were owned by people who were not Mexican and don't eat the Mexican. I was about to say, oh, you're probably like, especially uh, I'm going to ask you something later about Mexican (laughs) food. Oh, I can't wait because I'm in Texas. So I have hot I have hot opinions. Um, But so, you know. I talk, right? If you hear my voice and you don't know what I look like, and I've been told this a lot, like I talk white, right? Whatever. This actually happened to me last week for the first time. Someone said to me, you sound like a Kardashian. I heard that everywhere I went in Alabama. And what they- Before I forget, I'm going to just tell you, you need to get the book. You sound like a white girl by Julissa Arce. And you sound like a person. Let's just say that, like, it's just people's preconceptions of what somebody should sound like if black, white, Latino, whatever. So yeah, continue exactly, exactly. Where it would show up is like, and this was with black and white people. This wasn't just white people. So I want to make that clear. But like, if I go to a drive through and I order and then I show up, they're like confused because they're like, is this the wrong car? Because they can't fathom someone with darker complexion speaking the way that I speak. And then you add that I don't have a Southern accent. I'm clearly not from Alabama in the way that I speak. Um, But I would get told all the time, you sound like one of the Kardashians. You sound like a Kardashian girl. Because the Kardashians were super hot back then. That was like 2013, like peak Kardashian times. And um, what I gathered what that meant was you don't sound Black. You don't sound, you, you, it doesn't make sense. It's confusing. Cannot compute. Um, I dealt with racism that I don't really want to dive into because that's going to be a whole nother episode. But what I will say is I come (laughs) home, I come home, right? So you guys know my dynamic. I explained that I come home and I had a homecoming party and with all my friends who love me and they're not black. My friends from, as I mentioned, my, my high schools, the schools that I went to were white and Asian mostly. Um, And so I like my closest friends are not black and I come and I have this homecoming party for me and I locked myself in the bathroom and I'm crying and I told my mom to come pick me up and I said I feel like my friends don't like me because I'm black and she's like did someone say something I'm like no but I'm just realizing that I'm not like them and then maybe a couple days later my mom said something to me or she was being rude, whatever it was. And I just break down crying. And I said, I feel like you don't love me because I'm black. I feel like you regret that I'm black. I feel like you regret having a black daughter. I feel like you're ashamed of me. And what I love about my mother is she's so fierce. She's not the most emotional person. She's not necessarily the sweetest. But what I love about my mother is that she's also no bullshit. And so she was like, I'm not, she literally, she was like, I am not going to entertain this conversation. We're getting your ass into therapy. Like, she was just like, this is like, I don't know what this is, but this is not normal. And she's like, whatever this is, I don't have the capacity. And so I go to therapy and I'm explaining, like, I felt like my eyes were open to something I never knew. Because I experienced so much hatred by my coworkers, by people in traffic, by people at restaurants, by people at bars, like just all around my sorority, like that I was involved with, like they didn't let me in the, in the alumni chapter because I was black. I mean, just all these ridiculous things. I know all these ridiculous things that I felt like the, I finally understood what my father, who's from the South, grew up in segregated South, separate water fountains, separate schools. You know, all, he would talk about the Black South and, and white people, Black people, civil rights. And I would just roll my eyes like, Dad, that was so long ago. Like, welcome to the new age. 
And I felt like, oh my gosh, my dad is right. People are racist. People do hate me just because of the color of my skin. But then I couldn't escape it. And I was only there for one year. And one year of that exposure, of that immersion in a racist culture changed me for the rest of my life. Because now I have to hesitate. Like before, there were probably times where people were being racist assholes to me, but I was so ignorantly bliss, blissfully ignorant that I'm just like, oh, that person's having a bad day. And I just do 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 move along, like not realizing that they were probably doing some microaggression. I just thought jerks were jerks, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the color of my skin. Now, after going through PTSD therapy and really working on reprogramming my brain to understand both not everybody's racist, but also not everybody is not racist, is, um, you know, I have this moment where if I think I'm experiencing something that feels like a microaggression, I have to kind of go, huh, let's let's evaluate this. Like, I have to take a step back and go, am I reacting because of past trauma or am I taking it at face value? And then I need to collect evidence. So it can't just be one microaggression. I need to see like multiple examples of someone showing something that makes me go, okay, they're pro because there are a lot of reasons to not like me, right? Like it's, I can't pretend it's just because I'm black or Latina. I'm loud. I'm uh, aggressive, if you will. Like I'm very outgoing. I'm confident. I'm going to make you own your shit. I'm well-spoken. I speak fast. I think even more quickly. And I'm not one that you really want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with in an argument. And I'm going to make your head spin. That could be difficult in a business environment, especially when I'm working with, let's call it what it is, middle-aged white men. That's a lot. Yeah. It's just a lot for them to deal with. Like, uh, you know, a person, a woman running circles around them. I s emphasize woman, right? Because I say like, yeah. feel like a woman first. Um, and so that's where I kind of have to go. All right. And prayerfully, prayerfully, honest to goodness, what I say is, thank God that when I moved back from Alabama, I had the mindset that all white people hate me not the mindset I hate all white people because I had enough yeah. of positive experiences in my past to know that I have a lot of amazing, incredible Caucasian, white, mixed, whatever friends that I can put it in its place that it was like these particular ignorant people. But when you start seeing the same patterns from the same skin color all the time, it's hard. I'll be honest. If I hear a middle-aged white man with a Southern accent, like older, like older man, um, like a George Bush type, I do kind of get tense because it brings me back to these awful memories from that time of my life. And so what I, where I've landed now is that I don't care about worrying if someone's being racist. Like, honestly, I'm at the point, like, as, if you're not hurting someone, like physically hurting someone because of the color of their skin, I can handle it. Like, even if you're like, have this awful rhetoric and all like, okay, I can at least put that there. Like, did they physically hurt someone for the color of their skin? No. Okay. Right. We didn't kill someone just because they were black and they look like they deserve to get shot. Right. So if we can just like level that yeah. out, cool. Like I can like, all right, cool. You said something a little off, right? You said something. I don't, I don't really like what you're doing. Like I can put that in its place. What I'd rather focus on is, okay, can we look at the good that someone's done? Can we look at outside of this mistake that they said, outside of this mindset they might have? Because imagine if I grew up in Alabama, what would I think about race? If I grew up in Alabama, same exact thing, half black, half Mexican, how different would my life be if I grew up in Alabama? So I need to have compassion for everybody who grew up differently than I did. I feel bad for people who don't know that your race is like, first of all, take a 23 and me test. Like we're all the same stuff, guys. Give it 10 more years. Right. We're all going to be the same. <laughs> like, hate to break it to you. Like you hate Jewish people, honey. You're probably Jewish. Check your blood. Like you hate black people. You're probably African. Check your blood. So it's like, once we start realizing we're all the same, and we're all beautifully made differently, that's when we can better celebrate ourselves. I hope we can get over the race conversation so much faster. Like, I hope we get to that point. 
Isn't um, it crazy that we're still, that we still have to have these conversations over and over. And now it's like, the, it's like this pivot and everything. I want to just kind of go back to one thing that you said, and you said that you're aggressive. I'm going to say you're not aggressive. You're assertive. <laughs> right? Girl, I've gone through all of these things. I've been told I was abrasive. I've been told, you know, like all, like as women, right. Um, I don't know if you know, there were, I'm sure you saw that like Taylor Swift uh, article that came out a while ago um, in regards to this man saying she's not a good role model. She's 34, unmarried, no kids. She's dated a lot of men. And I'm like, she doesn't know very many women, does he? <laughs> like, because it was all so focused on her being a woman, 34, unmarried, no children. I'm 46. I'm not bearing any children. Thankful, you know, I've, my, my husband has some amazing kids who are, who I've got to now inherit, right. As, as being my kids as well, but I'm not having any kids, uh, like bearing any children, excuse me. Um, and the fact that so much is put on women because they're women, right. Because they can't, they can or cannot like bear children, they the color of all, of, like the various colors of all of our skin, the different, like the different mindsets that we have. If we, you know, you have that trad wife, you know, thing coming out in regards to, which is funny to me because these same women that are like, oh, I'm a traditional woman and blah, blah, blah. You're, they're still making money off of that. So I'm like, no, 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 you're on the internet. That's not, a, that's not like not a traditional, if you're, talking about that like traditional wife thing making money off the internet there's all these different things but using that perspective hat like you have you're a very accomplished woman very accomplished the fact that you have done marketing campaigns like i said that have reined in a billion dollars hat like do you feel like all of those things have been able to contribute to what you've been able to kind of put out into the world, been able to use all of those experiences? And how do you think that, do you think that within that world, people see beyond your skin color, see beyond you being, you know, Latina, you're, and you're beautiful, you're freaking gorgeous. It's ridiculous. You're smart. You very accomplished and you're gorgeous. This is why I was telling you joking, jokingly, but not jokingly, right? That's so unfair. <laughs> but do you feel like all of these experiences have have made you even better at what you're what you've done within marketing, within education, within writing your book? How do you feel like that's affected those things? I so I do reflect on this a lot. So I will say I grew up being told I was ugly all the time all the time. Nobody asked me to prom. Um, I went by myself. I mean, I, I went with friends, but I was the only one without a date. Like everybody else had a date. So I was the 27th wheel. Um, and I didn't have my first boyfriend until I was 22. So on the note of like attractive or not, like I've never really felt attractive. I appreciate hearing that. Um, and I'm also grateful for the filters and makeup that can kind of put, put me together. But um, you know, I think that a lot of my compassion and desire to connect with people comes from getting made fun of a lot, being ostracized a lot, feeling like an outsider all the time, um, for various reasons. And, um, because of that, like, I'm the kind of person that in a room, again, I'm always going to be the outsider. It doesn't matter. Like if you find a room full of Ella's, let me know. <laughs> like when, when is there ever a room that's overwhelmingly a bunch of mixed Latin, you know, it just, it doesn't happen. So I'm the minority in every room I walk into. And because of that, I'm always looking for the other. I was at a, I was at a, um, networking event and most of the people in the room were um in their 30s 30s 40s and I saw a woman in the corner and she was kind of standing by herself and she was in her 50s and so I went and spoke to her because I could tell she probably felt an age gap she probably had more ethnic background with the people in the room than I did 
But there are other myriad, there are a myriad of ways where we feel connected or disconnected to someone beyond our skin color, right? It could be religion. It could be our age is a big one. Our ableism, like the, the, the ability to walk, right? If you don't have that ability, if you're in a wheelchair, if you're in a cane, if you're in a walker, like these things are going to make a difference into how you feel connected. And because of the experiences I've had of feeling made fun of all the time, I'm always looking for the other in every room I'm in. I want to find the person who feels ostracized or feels like they don't fit in. And I think that's why I'm so amazing at marketing. That's why I'm so able to be able to connect and talk to people. And so while I really don't look back on my childhood fondly at all, I'm grateful for it because it gave me a deeper compassion and empathy because I never fit in. I was always analyzing what does it take to feel like you fit in? Why do they feel like they fit in? Why does she get to fit in, but I don't? Why am I the weirdo, right? And so all of this psychographic analytics kind of helped me in today that when a company says, hey, we're struggling with this or we're struggling with that or we want to target a new market or we want to grow our business or we want to build an innovation brand, I can tap into what makes people feel better about themselves, like the ethos behind it, the messaging, um, making sure that the message is delivered. I think all of that really comes back to this childhood of, of always feeling like the outsider. And really what brands are doing, I don't care what brand it is. I loved hearing you talk about the wines because that's what I do is beverage marketing. But the way you're like, oh, this is Latino owned. That's because that's important to you. To someone else, it might be more important that the winery is based in California because they only support California wines. And to someone else, it might be more important that that wine is a sustainable wine that's made only from grapes within North America. So it's supporting American businesses instead of European businesses, right? So it's the same wine, just different stories right. based upon the market to know what makes you like that wine more. And that's what I do. I could take one, I can take one wine in this example and create five different messages that are all valid, all authentic, all real, but have it target the the market to say like, okay, well, the surfers are going to like this wine because we take our grapes from Santa Barbara ocean spray or whatever. Right. Um, and the beautiful Latina women in San Diego, California are going to like this wine because it's Latino owned. And, you know, and that's where I can come in and figure out where, where might someone want to, where can we as a brand appeal to you, the consumer through messaging. And I honestly think it's because that's how I've always lived my life. I live a very inclusive life. I don't have a tolerance for evil. I don't have a tolerance for sinister, gross things like breaking the law or hurting people or, you know, things that are against the law. No. But outside of that, like, I don't care what you look like, who you have sex with, all what your political. I don't care. Like, I don't. This is a controversy. Like, I don't hate Trump and I don't have a problem with people who support Trump because I'm like, well, he was elected president. So obviously a lot of people appeal to him. So what am I doing? Am I doing myself a disservice by saying, oh, anyone who votes for him is a bad person? Well, wow, that's got to be a lot of bad. That's a lot of people because a lot of people voted for him. So I'm like, OK, let me better understand what is it about? Like, what is it about this person that is appealing. Like I care more about why people like something or don't like something rather than being so focused on they should or shouldn't like something. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to that person, I will say this. I, <laughs> I think... didn't mean to bring him up. I just know it's easy because it gets people hot. No, no, and, he doesn't no. get well, and hot. I'm not going to get like into, I think <laughs> what he does is he captures people's attention by focusing on one thing and saying it over and over and over and over and over and over again, he brings his language from like that. What I, I believe when they say like marketing and everything and advertising, unless it's targeted to kids, usually about 11th grade level. Right. Mm -hmm. He speaks to people at it. Like they, I saw something about a fifth grade level. So he brings it down makes it, palpable palpable I can't even talk palatable. palpable palpable for people but with but also like without 
maybe all of the information or the correct information. He just, he says what he thinks people want to hear that will bring him the vote. I don't think half the stuff he does, he actually believes. I think, I think he's just in it for himself, to be perfectly honest. But I think he knows what he's doing when, in regards to that. He knows his audience and he knows how to market to his audience. So that's, I, so I think people who feel like they had never been heard, because, you know, they feel like he hears them, even if he doesn't care about them, even if, you know, he, he knows his audience. So he knows appeal to that audience and people thrive on that because people ultimately want to feel heard. They want to feel understood. So, and, and if he can connect in that way, even though he's never been able to re truly relate to them, right. Based on his whole life, but he knows what he's doing. So I will like, I, I get that. I understand what you're saying. Um, and I get that. I don't like him, but that's okay. You know? <laughs> it's um, popular. It's popular to hate him. That's why I always pick on him because mm -hmm. it's popular. So the moment it's popular to hate a person, it's my Libra. So I'm a Libra rising. It's my Libra nature. Again, back to what I just said, right? I'm when a Gemini a room, rising. <laughs> oh, when there's a room full of people, I'm going to look for the outlier. I'm yeah. always like, I have this vigilant desire for justice and equality. And so part of that is going to be when the whole world is turning against someone because, and let's be real, I'm not equ equating this man to Jesus Christ. Like, no, not doing that <laughs> at all. Let's make that clear. But what did the whole world do to Jesus Christ? Turned on him, right? Murdered him. Mm -hmm. And the world was like, yeah, murder that guy, right? That's what... That's what everyone did. It was like the cool, popular thing to do was to kill Jesus Christ. And so for me, I think because I think the justice part comes from my mother being Latina, Mexican, you know, immigrant, my dad being a police officer. I'm always like, wait, the moment it's popular to hate someone, even Putin, right? The moment it's popular to hate someone, I'm like, okay, but then why is this person in power? What, like, I just, I want to analyze it a little bit. It's not to yeah. justify, but it's to really understand the psychology. Back to what you said, we all want to feel heard and seen. And if we can recognize that, then that's what I think our job should be on a micro level. When you walk, I always say, like, just look left to the right. Do you know the names of your neighbors? The people who know where you live and, and are the first to know if you die and all these things like... And we don't know our neighbors' names, right? And so if we can't even take the time to connect with our neighbors and we don't take the time to connect with the person in front of us at Starbucks, we're sitting there complaining that's a long line. No, it's an opportunity to connect with someone who thinks differently than we do. And what a beautiful yeah. opportunity to do that. And so I think that taking that, you know, on a micro level, because that's how I live my life. Like, I just want to connect with people and understand them, even if they're different, even if they're evil, even if, you know, whatever it might be, taking that, you know, and then creating a, a campaign that makes whoever they may be feel heard. Like, wow, I, I didn't, the first campaign I made that went national, I was 19 years old. And it's funny because okay. I didn't think of it this way, but it was it was targeting it was not an alcohol campaign for the record, but it was targeting girls who were getting their makeup done during prom. And it was such a popular campaign that my headquarters scaled it to be national. And yeah, because girls getting their makeup done at prom, they want to feel seen. They want to feel like, wait, for me? Wow. Thank you. Right. Because that's a. Yeah important moment for them and now we're a part the brand that I was working with is now a part of this special moment and so I was 19 when I created that campaign because I was like well I was just at prom a couple of years ago and I would have liked this right and so I think because I'm always trying to connect with all types of people I'm able to create campaigns that speak to them as well yeah I am I appreciate you like you doing that I'm that type of person where it's very I I try to put myself like I don't try to understand it but it's very hard for me to understand so I get very overwhelmed because I like much like you I wear my heart on my sleeve and I 
like I will rack my brain to understand why somebody's doing something or why something and I just don't get it. Like again, when I think of, of racism or when I think of things like that, I'm like, I, I don't understand it. And it makes me go like little loony inside because then I just start spiraling because it's so hard. There's just so much to grasp. I can't grasp it. So I just have to be like, you know, like with everything that's going on in the world right now, for me, if I constantly was reading and, and watching that, I would not be able to function because my bleeding heart, like just once I'll just start going down the rabbit hole. And then I like, I would lose all focus on everything else. And because I don't like in my soul, in my DNA, I do not understand that type of hate. I don't understand that type of, you know, like, like visceral reaction and why, like it just, even now it, you can hear the way that I've talked has changed because if I start thinking about it, I just, it becomes very overwhelming. Yeah. I shouldn't have brought up the so, two word. I'm sorry. It riles people up. No, no, no. It's I, a, no I think it's in general, in general, yeah. like, and not no, just totally. him. I'm just saying like, no, yeah. In general, no, I've been like that my whole life where it, it's, like people, when people were talking about like the Holocaust, when we were learning about the Holocaust in school, or when we were talking about like talking about the trail of tears, when we're talking about slavery, like growing up, I would just start bawling because I didn't understand how people could hurt people so um, viciously, so intently. So like, I just never got it. Um doing all that because you're responsible for a lot of things right like you've worked with celebrities and you've worked with you know um sports brands you've worked with all of these things how like what makes you not be able to go crazy because that's a lot of high profile things that you've done right working you know doing beverage marketing um how are you able to kind of stop at one point because i know when you have a lot of things like that, a lot of high profile projects, it could overwhelm you where that's what you're constantly thinking about 24 seven. So how do you like try? I mean, is there ever really truly a balance, but how do you try and find time for yourself where you've disconnected from that so you can actually enjoy your life? I will say I haven't been the best at that. I mean, I can preach it all day long and fake it, but I just haven't. I will, it's, it is a blessing that I'm in an industry that is lifestyle oriented. So the personal and the professional get really blurred, right? I'm a huge football fan. So if I have to go to a football game for work, am I on, am I working or am I enjoying myself? If I'm going to a football game, which I find it hard, if I try to go to like a football game or a concert when it's not work related and turn my brain off, I can't. I'm just looking at the menus, the marketing, the marquees, the LEDs. Then I'm looking at all the advertisements going, oh my gosh, they did that wrong. Oh, that looks terrible. I feel like almost if I'm there for work and just know that I have a role to play at whatever it is I'm doing at the game, I'm not doing that as much. Or if I am, I justify it of like, oh, like this is for work. So I'm doing research. But I, I'm not the best at that balance. And I think that's why it's perfect that I'm in a space that's, you know, sports, entertainment, beverage, like you're drinking a beverage right now. Like, yeah, I can't tell you how many glasses of wine I've had while working, how many wine tours I've done for work. Like, and so I think finding where I'm really blessed is that I found a space where, yes, I'm always on. I'm always got my work brain on. It's it's doesn't stop. That's probably why I'm able to create campaigns. I'm I'm an insomniac. A lot of my best ideas come in the middle of the night when I should be sleeping and then I get up and write them down. I've learned not to go to my computer because then I will never go back to sleep, but I will get up and I'm like if this idea is good enough, I'll write it down and if it's that good, I'll remember in the morning and and finish it. Um but I'll be honest, I'm not the best at balance. Um, I'm not the best at turning it off. What I will say is that I was on the path 
to being a doctor. When I got an internship with Red Bull, which was the first beverage company I worked for while I was in college, um, I was I was pre-med. And it sounds so silly or so um, hippie to say, like, follow your heart. But I was really only being pre-med because I thought the world wanted me to be a doctor. Yes, I want to help people. Yes, I want to heal people. Yes, I wanted to be a doctor. But I was really doing it for not my own soul's fulfillment and purpose, but because I felt like that's what you should do if you want to help people. It's crazy to say that working in alcohol marketing, I help and heal people, but I actually get the opportunity to. I get to talk to people from all walks of life. I've given jobs to convicted felons who otherwise would have been overlooked by other corporations, but I had the opportunity to give a job. I've been able to to give people promotions. I've helped develop people. I've helped them build better lives, buy houses for their families. I've helped and healed a lot of people and not just by cutting them up, sewing them, giving them a prescription. And so I think that when we are living in our purpose, we don't have to worry so much about the balance because the balance just comes naturally. I think when we're trying to shut off our work, like I I can't imagine, you know, my dad was a police officer. There's no shutting off that work. There's no shutting off that work. There just is. There's never going to be a balance. He probably looks at everything with with those eyes, right? With law enforcement eyes. Yeah. And now I do too. Thank you, dad. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I do know that you also, and and I would, I would imagine like your background really lends itself to your work with Casa. Um, And if those who don't know, Casa is uh, like a court court appointed. uh, Specialist advocate. But yeah, so you work with kids going through the court system, going, you know, being their advocate um, and, and being like, you're not a therapist, you're not there, but you're just, you know, I would, what, how did you get involved? Like that says, I think pretty much across the nation. Um, how did you get involved with that? And do you feel like everything that you've gone through really kind of helps your philanthropic efforts in that? So I will say, first of all, I'm so happy that you know CASA at all, because I feel like so many people don't know what CASA is, and it is such a passion of mine. And oh my gosh, my goal is to just get super, super wealthy so I can give all my money to like the poor and CASA and all the above. Um, But the way that I started at CASA was because they have a national um, partnership with the sorority with which I was involved in college. So it really came onto my radar because we were required to do volunteer hours. I also want to clarify, so CASA is Court Appointed Special Advocates. This is a particular person who helps children who are in the foster care system, and they stay with them no matter what, unless they move outside of the state, then it gets a little sticky. But outside of something dramatic like that, you know, these children have different um, social workers. Like I have a, a foster child who's on his, he's 20 months and he's on his third social worker. I mean, social workers rotate like crazy. Judges rotate like crazy. Lawyers rotate like crazy. But that CASA stays with that child until the day they turn 18. And now if they opt in, even till they're 21. And so a child who is bouncing around from foster care to parents' house to reunification, back to foster care, whatever it is, they have that one adult who commits to staying by their side for every court appointment, for every for certain visitations, all these things. Um, it's a very, very intense job that I am not willing to do. So I do not, I am not a CASA. I have been asked to be a CASA because of my background. They're like, oh my gosh, we would love more CASAs that look like you because the children, you know, overwhelmingly it's more black and brown children in the foster care system in America. Um, And so they want more CASAs that, that have my background, but I don't have the emotional capacity for it or the ability to make that type of commitment when I travel so much, I work so much. I can't just at two in the morning go to jump up and and go for, for things. I'm not at that point in my life. But 
where I have supported CASA for the last 20, 20 or so years is through fundraising. So helping and volunteering with fundraising events, helping with marketing, um, helping spread the word about CASA because for people who, um, you know, are interested in like doing a big brother, big sister program, that might be the only program they know about. And that's an amazing program. I've worked with B BBBS as well, but Casa, if that really calls to you and you want to be a part of helping the foster care system specifically, my goal is to bring more light to this amazing organization. Um, but I am not a CASA myself. Um, I'm a fundraiser. So helping raise awareness and funds for them. Um, we put on a really great event here in Dallas every year with the young alumni, uh, sorry, with the young, uh, young adult we call it group. Um, and it's called Casablanca and I love it. So I volunteer for that. And, um, I help decorate and, uh, down the line, we'll see if I help negotiate some contracts to help, you know, save dollars on the event. Um, so that way we can give more donations back to, um, the organization, but it is such a special place in my heart. I always thought I'd be a mom by now. And while at times I am heartbroken that I'm not a mother and that I really thought that was going to be my path, I think about the fact that everyone, again, we all have a special purpose. And ultimately, where I will probably find motherhood, if I do, is it will probably be through adoption or foster care. And I think that that's beautiful. And we and I know firsthand that we need it. Um, my father was adopted and had he not been adopted, he would have ended up in the system. And as a black boy in the sixties, God only knows how different his fate would have been. Um, and so I'm like, okay, I want to be, a, I want to help make this world, this country, a better place. And a big part of that is like, we got to take care of, of these kids. You know, we have 4 million kids in the system who need more adults and advocates. And so while I'm not physically there yet, I'm on the back end financially helping raise some funds. I mean, and that is so important because without the funds, a lot of the things wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get done. Um, I do want to ask you one uh, question before we wrap it up. Um, with all of these, like we, we've really, I told you we were going to cover a lot of different things. I wasn't lying, was I? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. Um, what What do you think has been like through this journey? What outside? I mean, obviously, a bit. I could obviously a big low point was your time in Alabama, and and that I would imagine, right? But just career wise, what ha has there ever been a time where you're like, I, what am I doing? Like this is not like where you just felt completely lost. And how did you feel like you were able to focus to get back on the path that you're on now? Yeah, I am December 2022 physically. So Alabama, you're right, will always be the worst time of my life. It just, it will be like I, because I was so young and disenfranchised that I didn't stand up for myself in a way that like that wouldn't fly today. If, if I experienced stuff like that, I'd either remove myself or move on. But at that time I was young and didn't have a lot of advocacy and didn't know any better. Um, so that's one of the worst times in my life where I felt very disenfranchised, but physically I went through, so I've had some health issues. The reason why I wanted to be a doctor originally was because I've been in and out of the hospitals and I've, I've had a lot of health issues. And in December, 2022, I had four surgeries and it was in the middle of, if you can imagine December, okay, December, I think my surgery was December 8th, 2022. December is like when the alcohol business gets really busy. We have football, oh, yeah. baseball, hockey, and basketball all going on, plus the holidays, right? So it's a very, very busy season. And you're prepping for the Super Bowl the next, you know, in a couple months. And so when my doctor told me, you need to have surgery now, I was like, oh, this is like the worst season. Like I have Super Bowl and Christmas and New Year's Eve and I have all these campaigns and, and, and the doctor, she looked at me like, I don't think you understand, like you could die. Like this isn't a joke, you know? And she, and so I had these surgeries and I was completely laid out. I was on bed rest for about eight weeks. I was in physical therapy for 15 weeks after that. And it was awful. It was awful. And it all happened so fast that a lot of my coworkers weren't aware that I went on medical leave. 
And my phone was still blowing up with people asking about their vodka order or like when word got out that I wasn't working anymore because people didn't know why I had several like of the large alcohol companies reaching out to me asking if I was looking for a job. (laughs) So here I am having conversations with like a whiskey company about their new innovation that they're relaunching. And I'm like, I don't think he knows that I'm literally in a hospital bed, like bleeding out right now. Um, And so I was in so much pain. I felt so alone. Um, Again, not married, having to have my parents as my emergency contact. And they're the ones taking me to the hospital. And I'm like, my parents are in their 50s and 60s. Like they shouldn't be worried about their 30 plus year old daughter. Like, were you living in California at the time or were you in Dallas? Oh, I was living in Dallas, but I had no one to take care of me here. So I had to come home for my surgeries because one, that's where all my doctors are anyway. But two, I was like, what am I going to, the doctors were like, you can't, you can't, you need help. Like you're in a need care. So I went back home for two months, two full months, like back at home. And then I came back to Dallas to do physical therapy. But it was such a lone, and then it's Christmas, right? So it's Christmas season. It's like the loneliest time if you're alone, you really feel alone. And I am so loved. I mean, my room looked like a funeral parlor. I had more flowers than anyone could hope to even have when they die. Like, I I know that I'm very loved. I know that I'm very blessed. And I had the best care that money could buy. But what I can tell you is that all the money in the world doesn't matter when you wish you were dead because you're in so much pain. You just don't want to live anymore. Um, And you feel alone and you feel like a burden and you feel like, what's the point? And then, wow, cool. Ella Parler sold billions of dollars of alcohol. Yay. You know, and you're kind of just like, what's this all about? And so that's when I started writing my book, High Tolerance. I was like, I'm going to write write a breakup letter to this career. And I talked about it from A to Z. It goes A, like starting my career, Z, in the hospital. I mean, that's literally where the book goes. And when I wrote this book, I really thought that the whole industry would turn their back on me and just say, well, screw you. Like you're you're saying all this stuff about, you know, my observations of alcohol consumption in this country. But what ended up being a what was a breakup letter Um, turned into like a rallying cry for a lot of us in the industry who are looking for a change, who are looking for more balance, who are looking for more purpose, who are looking to be seen and heard because we're working behind the scenes and we're, you know, we're looking for purpose in our work. And so now where it's kind of come full circle is I get to work with brands who are trying to create purposeful work, purposeful campaigns, take care of their employees, boost morale, keep people safe and happy and healthy within the context of drinking. Um, and now that's going into the non-alcoholic, non-alcoholic space as well as that becomes a much bigger category within this space. Um, but absolutely. I mean, laying there in the hospital, wondering, you know, first it was like, does she have cancer? And then I had to get treatments and all this stuff. It's just like, you're staring at your feet in the bed and we're all going to do it, whether we know it or not. We are all going to face those final moments. I just got a taste of it at a younger age. But those final moments, you don't care about the work you did. You don't care about the title you have. What you care about is who's surrounding you, who's with you, who loves you, and and how did you make the world a better place? Um, and so while I'm really proud of the work that I've done, what I'm more proud of, and I say this in my book, I'm more proud of all the many people that I've been able to work, empower, give jobs to, help develop, help make them better, help build the business. Like I've helped people dr- build their dream businesses, you know, people who get into the alcohol industry and they don't know anything about the business. And then I can help fix some of their mistakes. Um, and really just empower people to live the life of their wildest dreams. And so that's what I hope to do. And that's why I wrote the book. I hope that it inspires other people to know that you don't ever have to be stuck in whatever situation you are. Um, there are resources available. There are people out there rallying for you. There are people who love you that you just haven't met yet. 
And so that's what I was hoping to kind of relay um, to others. And I'm glad it's like kind of weird. Like if I do die tomorrow, heaven forbid, like this book will be out there for everyone to just get the message forever. <laughs> like it's, it's out there, it's out. And I'm, that is probably my proudest achievement. And the fact that it landed on several bestseller lists was just, just, I'm still processing a note of celebrating. I haven't even celebrated that. And that was like nine months ago, seven months ago. Like I still haven't celebrated the fact that Ella, I'm giving you an assignment <laughs> to celebrate yourself. And I'm going to follow up with you and be like, have you, because I get, cause I don't do that either. Right. As you know, so many of us, we just keep going like, okay, that happened. Let's now what's the next thing. Right. And I have learned so much. Like I'm part of the, we all grow Latina and, you know, it's like we have in our office hours, like, what have you celebrated? There's a thing in one of our, like, who do you want to give flowers to? Or what do you want to get your flowers for? And it's a reminder that we need to celebrate ourselves, right? We can't always rely on other people. And, you know, I am guilty as anybody and then people are like, oh, what have you done? I'm like, I don't know. And then people are like, well, you've done this or you've done this. Because I forget because I'm like, oh, yeah, that's great. Now let's go to the next thing. But we got to celebrate ourselves. So I'm going to follow up with you and be like, <laughs> have you celebrated yourself? You better. Um, oh, so California Mexican food or Tex-Mex? I hate Tex-Mex. I don't like it. I'm not into it. So it's gross. not real Mexican food. It's America's version. It's one, uh, it's a few notches above Alabama Mexican food. I'm like, Wait, let me say, Mexican. <laughs> the first time people are like, oh, order queso. Or, and I'm like, get, if you order queso at a Mexican restaurant in California, they're going to bring you shredded cheese. Yes. That's what they're going to bring you. And it's not queso, it's queso, queso. Yeah, oh yeah, it's queso, it's queso. Queso. I'm like, you know. (laughs) But I will say, it is pretty good. (laughs) I, so that was my Bumble, that was my Bumble, like, bio for so, Bumble is a dating app. It was my biography for so long. I I hate hate queso. Really? Oh my gosh, my, it was, I hate queso, because that's what everyone ate. It felt like it it was really weird to me that everywhere I went, everyone was eating queso all the time and they're saying queso. And then they don't say Guadalupe. They say Guadalupe. I, I cannot. I'm like, yeah, we're going to go to the Guadalupe river. And I'm like, I, Guadalupe river. Guadalupe. Like I've been, I floated, I've, I floated the river. I've gone there. And then when they're like, let's slap the bag. And I'm like, why I don't get the slap the bat like it makes just drink just drink why are you like it's so funny. it's so funny yeah but I so that's a, that is a little bit of a transition but I will say like Dallas is so far from the border like I think yeah like, like for where I grew up in Orange County being two hours from the border like I feel like it would be more like San Antonio probably has less Tex-Mex that's my guess I don't know but I would guess that like yeah you know like the closer you get to the border the more authentic the you food gotta is, go to like... Jefferson that's where you gotta go for your food Ooh, you what's gotta that? go to Oak Cliff you gotta go to oh. Oak Cliff okay okay Oak Cliff I like Oak Cliff one yeah. of my favorite restaurants in Oak Cliff is Calle 12 and it is Calle 12 is um, it's so good like le- they are legit okay um, I'll take it and I will they take do it. have they do have queso there but they I think they have queso fundido there which is you know Mexican yeah. um and they do have other things but like I love their um siete mares cocktail and I will get in it I get the large one and I'll get like a little soup to go with it. It's so good. You got to go to Calle Doce. I won't say Okay, you with Calle Doce. I like that. No, thank you. I'm going to add it to my list. I have a list of restaurants to like for when I'm bored and don't know what to do. So I'm literally going to put it to the top of my list. Yeah. There's another Calle Doce off Skillman, but I like to go to the original one. The original one is off of 12th and it looks like a little house. It's like a little white house, a little white and blue house. But it's, yeah, it's so, so good. 
That's so wonderful. I will stir you around, I promise. <laughs> I love this conversation so very much. I'm so grateful for you. This was so uplifting and wonderful. And I want to hear more about you. That's what I'm excited to hear more about. I really <laughs> want to hear more about everything that you're doing and empowering. And just, I'm I'm really excited to connect with you. Oh, me too. You know, I do. Ch- I was in Dallas last year because I took my podcast on tour. Um, so I was in Dallas last year. So I try and go to Dallas like every other year. Um, so hopefully next year I'll be able to go this year. I'll be in New York again, like New York's my, like I've been going every year for the past several years. Um, and then, yeah, I went to Dallas in 2021 and then 2023 last year. So next year I'll be in Dallas, but if you're in Orange County, if you come back, let me know. Cause well, and I just, I'm on a book tour too. So I'm all over the place. Oh <laughs> I'm yeah. All, I'm like, you're in New York. I'm at, let's meet in New York. That works for let's me. Let's go. Um, <laughs> so, well, okay. So how do people find out where you're going for your book tour? Okay. I, oh, I like your, <laughs> this is the worst question. So I've gotten some slaps on the wrist recently because I actually have never announced a book signing publicly. Like I've, and I just, I, I get a lot of anxiety before a book signing. Like I get like to the point where I want to cancel it. I'm crying. Like it's bad. Like right before I regret it. I'm like, why am I doing this? I shouldn't have done this in New York a few weeks ago. I like, I did not want to go. I was like, I need to back out, but I'm also not a quitter. Like I don't, I don't flake. So I'm, you know, it's like, okay, you flew out here. You're here. I show up, there's people lined up and I'm like, what are you guys lined up for? Well, what are you guys here for? And they're like, your book (laughs) we're here for you and I'm like me me like I I just couldn't believe it and it was such an amazing like experience so yeah I get to go back um I'm going back next month but it's a private it's a private event where I'm speaking um about my book and um so I'm looking at I just haven't announced them publicly because I get I just get so nervous and I figure my followers and my people already have my book so they're not gonna come oh so I, wait <laughs> I'm like okay you- <laughs> I've gotten in trouble though because when I did the one in New York I do have a lot of friends in New York I've been to New York several times I've worked in New York for years and people were pissed at me they were like you came to New York city for a book signing and didn't tell me. And I'm like, well, I figured you already had the book. Like, okay, do this. This is what I want you to do. I'll give you another assignment. Besides <laughs> celebrating yourself. You just send me, you don't have to post it. You just send me. Like, I feel like I'm talking about the book too much. Book so that's why I don't I will, No, Okay. So thing. here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I'm telling you this. I'm telling anybody else who is listening, right? When you're doing stuff on social media, you never know who's going to see it. Maybe somebody's not on that day. And with the algorithm, you never know. So you got to post it. You got to make a post. You got to make a reel. You got to make a story. If you use YouTube, you got to use, like, you have to use all of the avenues. If you have a newsletter, you got to put it on your newsletter. Like, here you are doing a podcast. Like, you got to put it everywhere because you don't, like, your audience is, uses very you know all different things all different platforms so it's because I get it I feel the same way sometimes I feel like it's too much but then people are like oh I didn't even know I may have only posted it two times but what if I posted it that third time that it would they would have seen it so it's never too much you get to celebrate yourself because this is a really (laughs) big deal Ella it is a big deal and you so I'm very good at hyping other people up. I'm bad about hyping myself up. That's what I'm I'm very good about. (laughs) I'm normally on the other side of this conversation because, like, I definitely know how to promote event. It's kind of what I do for a living. Like, I kind of know a little bit about blast, (laughs) but I'm like, I there's just a blinder for me, and and I'm okay with it because the book, you know, I really want. I just I want to touch people, but I did have someone say your message needs to be heard. Do you understand that there are other women who are in hospital beds that need your book, but you're not telling them about your book and you're doing them a disservice and how dare you rob them of your story? And I was like, well, 
Okay. So I'm, I'm working on it, but like I'll promote your product all day long. Okay. I can do that all day long, (laughs) but when it's my book, it just feels so self indulgent. And um, I get it. Yeah. I get it. It's not, you're going to be okay. I get in, you know, get everybody go to ellaparlor.com. Follow Ella on social, on Instagram. I will post everything in the show notes and I'll post it in the notes in YouTube as well. But Ella, thank you. I had such a great time. We're going to, we're going to continue to keep in touch for sure. But I had such a great time, you know, talking to you and hearing your story. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you so very much, Jessica. This was awesome. This was so fun. I had a great time. Oh, yay. Until next time, mi gente. Hola, mi gente. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wine and Cheese Med podcast. If you would like to hear more wine and more cheese, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Saludos.